Hey there, I'm Carrie, and welcome back to Of Mice and Men by John Steinbeck. In this video, I'm gonna talk about section two. So I'm gonna do a summary first and then some analysis, talk about the kind of things you would see on a test or in an essay question. I'll put timestamps in the video notes, so definitely scroll down, click around, find exactly what you need. All right, so to review, in chapter one, we met our two lead guys, George and Lenny. Now, George is kind of the leader, kind of the parent in this situation. Um, and Lenny, though he's a big guy, is very childlike. They are on their way to some new jobs on a ranch near Soledad, California. They have left their jobs in a place called Weed after a bad incident that happened there. They make camp for the night um, on a river bank where George tells Lenny a story about the farm that they are gonna buy someday and the life that they are going to have there. Before they fall asleep, George tells Lenny to take a good look around, remember the campsite, and if he's ever in trouble, he should come back to this place. All right, let's get into section two. Okay, so the location for all the action in the section is always in the first sentence. And this section happens in the bunkhouse on the ranch where uh, George and Lenny have come to get their new jobs. It's about mid-morning, like 10 a.m.-ish. So they have made it to the ranch uh, near Soledad, and the first guy that they meet is a dude called Candy. Now, Candy is kind of an older gentleman. He's the ranch swamper, so he's kind of like a building caretaker. He's been on the ranch a long time, and he tells George and Lenny all about the people that they are going to meet on the ranch. Another thing you should know about Candy is he owns a very old sheep dog. Uh, he's had it since it was a puppy. It was a great sheep dog back in the day, but now the dog is just very old. Um, but Candy loves it and it lives with him there in the bunkhouse. Now the first guy they meet is the boss, the ranch owner, who Candy tells them is a nice guy. Uh, he questions George and Lenny and unfortunately Lenny forgets what George told him about, hey, keep quiet while I talk to the boss and get us set up. The boss immediately becomes suspicious of them and he questions if George is exploiting Lenny. He's like, are you taking this guy's pay away from him? Like, what is going on here with the two of you? But so anyways, they kind of get through this awkward encounter, they get the jobs and they get set up in the bunkhouse. Now, the next guy that we meet is the boss's son, a guy named Curly. And Candy lets him know that he's kind of a scrappy, Little dude, he's done some uh, boxing, like some semi-professional boxing, and he always wants to fight. Candy warns them that Curly hates any guy that is bigger than him. Sure enough, Curly shows up and he immediately has an attitude problem when he meets George and Lenny. He sees Lenny, who's a very big man, and he's immediately on his guard. He even like squares up to fight, like right then. Like he kind of like, gets in a crouch and wants to fight Lenny like right away, even though he's never even met him. So we can tell that Curly is gonna be a problem. But as soon as Curly leaves, George warns him like, stay away from this guy, just as far as you can away. If he's in the room, you leave the room. Just keep your distance from him. If he attacks you, fight back, but as much as you can, just stay away. Candy also tells them that Curly is recently married and his wife lives there on the ranch with them. And Curly's attitude is like even worse since he got married. In fact, he's walking around with just one glove on and he tells all the other ranch hands that the glove is full of Vaseline so he can keep that hand soft for his wife. George is like grossed out. He sees Curly for exactly what he is. He's like, he is a lot of talk, he's a bully and why would you go around saying a thing like that? Next, we meet Curly's wife. Uh, so Candy tells George like, I think Curly has married a tart. Uh, I think his wife, I mean, well, you'll see when she gets here because she's, she's around. Sure enough, she shows up. She's a very young woman. Her hair is very elaborately styled. She's wearing a lot of eye makeup, uh, red lipstick. She's got red nail polish on. She even has red shoes on. Uh, the narrator says she's got red mules with ostrich feathers on them. And she comes right into the bunkhouse and she kind of poses against the door and wiggles around, makes sure all eyes are on her. And she says, hey guys, I'm looking for Curly. Have you seen him? As soon as she leaves, George warns Lenny, like, 
you need to stay away from Curly's wife too. She is wanting to cause trouble. Candy says she's got the eye, meaning she's looking to cheat. She is jailbait, she's a rat trap. You keep away from her. Now, Lenny is getting very apprehensive about all this. He even asked George if we can leave. He's like, I don't like it here. I don't like these people. They're making me nervous. Can we just leave? George tells him, no, we gotta stay, we gotta work, we need to earn some money. Luckily, the next guy who comes in is Slim, and Candy tells him, Slim is a hell of a nice fella. The narrator tells us that he's the jerkline skinner, which means that he's a leader on the ranch because he runs a mule team. He is running one of these work crews. And he is probably a little older than the other guys, and he just kind of has like a wisdom about him. He seems very chill, he's very observant, he just kind of instinctively understands people and he welcomes George and Lenny and he's really kind to them. Last guy we meet in this chapter is a man called Carlson. Now he is another ranch hand um, who walks in to wash up before lunch, you know, introduces himself and then immediately engages Slim in a conversation about uh, Slim's dog. Slim has a dog that has just had puppies. Now, this is not as innocent as it seems. You see, Carlson has got his eye on Candy's old sheepdog, this very old dog that Candy refuses to get rid of. And he's like, hey, I've got an idea. Why don't you give Candy one of the puppies from this new litter, and then he can get rid of that old sheepdog. Just convince him to shoot that dog. Just get rid of that dog. He's very um, consumed by how much he doesn't like this dog. Well, after meeting Slim, um, that kind of calms George and Lenny down a bit. Um, Lenny especially is excited because he hears that Slim's dog has a new litter of puppies and George promises to ask if Lenny can have one of the puppies. The lunch bell rings and everybody heads out and George and Lenny are ready for their first afternoon at work. That is the end of section two. All right, now let's do some analysis. You know, we'll kind of revisit the themes and talk about uh, some of the stuff that comes up in this chapter. First, let's talk about the setting. It's mid-morning and we're in the bunkhouse where all the ranch hands live. The bunkhouse is pretty sparse. There's not a lot in there. You know, everybody has a wooden box, an apple box at the end of their bunks where um, they can fit you know, maybe a couple toiletries, like a bar of soap and maybe one or two personal items. That's really all the space they have, except for the bunk where they can put their bedroll down. The only other furniture is a card table. It's all very temporary. And that kind of reflects the fact that a lot of these workers are temporary. They are not expecting to stay for a long time. So they don't get a lot of space to stash their belongings because they're not gonna be there long enough to collect a lot of stuff. This chapter is kind of like a roll call. Just about everybody who has a role in this book shows up in this section. Um, the only one who doesn't physically show up is the stable hand Crooks, and they do talk about him. He's mentioned, so he's kind of, you know, he's here in this chapter as well. So yeah, everybody that's gonna be important, you're gonna meet them right here. The first that we hear about everyone on the ranch is from Candy. We get our first hints about them from what Candy tells us. And like we have good vibes about Candy because he's older, he's been on the ranch a longer time, he's lost his hand in a work accident, so he's not part of the work crews anymore, so there's not any like competition um, or tension between him and any of the other workers. Also, we, he has his old sheepdog, you know, he has this dog that's very fond of him. And you know what they say about, you know, dogs are people's best friends, you know, animals have like this sixth sense, they know who's a good person. The fact that the dog really loves candy kind of lets us know like, this is a good guy. We talked in chapter one about the major themes being loneliness and dreams, but there's another kind of smaller element going through here and it comes out in chapter two and that is power. You know, who's got it, who doesn't have it, and what do people do with it? How do people respond to it? And again, we get our first hints about who's got the power from Candy. Like he lets us know how to feel about all of the characters. The first guy that Candy introduces them to is the boss. Candy tells them 
He's a nice fella. You don't need to worry about him. He's a good guy. The narrator tells us he's a little stocky man, uh, you know, meaning even though he's short, he's kind of muscled up. Now he's wearing nicer clothes than the other workers are, including high heeled boots. Now that's not boots with like a stiletto heel. He's talking about riding boots, Western riding boots. Now those are very different from work boots. They're made of different materials. They're built differently. They're not comfortable to walk in. So if you are wearing these high heeled riding boots, you are not looking to go out and load grain. You are riding a horse. That's pretty much the only thing those boots are good for. So this is a signal that like he's a supervisor here. He does have a hat that the narrator calls a soiled brown Stetson. Soiled means like it's kind of beat up. It's dirty. So that gives us a hint. You know, he does spend a lot of time outside, you know, probably was a working man once upon a time. Like he's earned his place a little bit, you know, someone to be respected. Now, what's really interesting about him is that he is suspicious of George. The fact that uh, George kind of keeps Lenny from talking like, hey, Lenny, be quiet, I'll handle this. He gets very suspicious of George, not of Lenny. In fact, he questions him. He's like, what is going on here? Are you taking this guy's pay? And even though that puts George and Lenny under some pressure, I think it's actually a good sign because he's letting them know, like, I don't like bullies. Like, I'm not gonna put up with you taking advantage of someone on my watch. Next guy we meet is Curly. And Candy tells us, like, he's a scrapper and he hates big guys. Now, Curly is short like his father, but he's not muscled up like his father. He's a pretty slim guy. However, like his dad, he's wearing these high heeled boots, these riding boots to show that he is not one of the work crew. He is a supervisor. However, the fact that he is pretty young, he doesn't have a beat up jacket or hat to show that he is used to doing work makes us kind of think he probably didn't earn that spot. Now, as soon as he sees Lenny, Curly is like ready to go. He has not even been introduced and he like jumps into a boxing stance. Oh. Curly is very different than his father in his response to the power that he thinks he has. Like his dad, who is the boss, uses that power to say like, you're not gonna be bullying anybody on a place where I'm in charge. Whereas Curly sees himself as powerful and that is just licensed to do whatever he wants. You know, he can pick on anybody he wants, he can behave however he wants, and he's gonna be sure that everybody knows just how strong and powerful he is. And he hates any kind of threat to that. He sees a bigger guy as a threat to that. It's a threat to his dominance. And that's why he hates Lenny just as soon as he sees him. Candy also tells us that Curly's attitude and behavior is even worse since he got married. Curly really perceives his wife as a power symbol. You know, we're on this ranch with all men and there's only one woman and she belongs to me. It's uh, a prestige thing. It's not a relationship with him. It's not a caring thing. It's just a status symbol. You know, the thing about the Vaseline story, it's, it's weird, but that's just him, you know, again, showing that he believes himself to be powerful. You know, he wants to brag about his sex life in front of all the other men. It also shows us he doesn't have much of a relationship with his wife. If your partner wants to keep something private, you should respect that. If you don't respect their wish to keep something private, that's a signal that you don't care about their comfort level, uh, you don't care about their peace of mind, you don't care about what they want. It's a huge mark of disrespect, a major red flag that this is a dysfunctional relationship that Curly has with his wife. Now, George picks up on this right away. Not only is Curly a bully, but he's full of it. George is not impressed by this glove full of Vaseline story at all. In fact, he actually makes a joke that Curly is probably eating raw eggs, which at one time people believed that eating raw eggs could cure sexual dysfunction in men. Next up, we meet Curly's wife and Candy tells us she's a tart. He says, I think Curly may have married 
a tart. The word tart, we kind of laugh at. It's it's so outdated that like it's funny to us. You know, in Pitch Perfect 3, the Rebel Wilson has a joke where she says like, "Let's get tarted up." You know, meaning like you know, let's get fixed up. Let's dress sexy. Let's go out on the town. It's not an insult to us because it's such an out of date term. To a 1930s audience, this would have been offensive. This is a slap in the face. To call a woman a tart, it's not a joke. It's not funny. It's an insult and it's meant to hurt. Try to imagine the attitudes about women that a 1930s audience would have had and what they would have gotten from this description of her. She's very heavily made up. You know, she's got an elaborate styling to her hair, heavy eye makeup, red lipstick, red nail polish. Just from a practical standpoint, she lives on a ranch. You know, she's not going anywhere. There's not really a reason to spend a ton of time on her hair. It's also very hot and dusty. So makeup is definitely gonna have like some liabilities there. Um, the fact that sh her nails are done show us that she's probably not doing a lot of work there on the, there on the ranch. And her shoes, these very flouncy shoes, they're red mules with ostrich feathers. They're impractical for doing any kind of work. These are hints that the author is dropping about her, you know, like, well, she's probably not a very hard worker. She's probably lazy. She just wants attention. She is like her husband and she's kind of insecure about her relationship to power, but she wants to grab hold of it. And she does that by getting attention. You know, she walks into inappropriate places. She dresses very impractically. Um, she makes sure that all eyes are on her. You know, the author says she poses against the door and she wiggles around so that the men will look at her. And like her husband, she sees Lenny as a target. He doesn't have much of a filter. And when the other men know to look away, uh, Lenny doesn't really get that message. So as soon as she leaves, George starts telling him like, you stay away. She is trouble. She is causing trouble and she's going to get you into trouble. This is where you really start to see a lot of those attitudes about women, kind of these misogynistic sexist attitudes. She is jailbait. She's a rat trap. You know, the the signal that she's wearing uh, red nail polish and red makeup. Red is a danger color. It's a signal, stop, danger, hazardous. Um, this is a signal like women are dangerous. Women are gonna trip you up. So yeah, Curly and his wife, quite a pair. Next guy that we meet is Slim. Candy tells us that Slim is a hell of a nice fella. He is a leader on the ranch. He's a jerkline skinner, which means he runs mules. But Candy tells us like he doesn't wear high heeled boots. He doesn't need to wear high heeled boots. Slim is a team leader. He works with horses and mules. And so like the boss, he could be wearing high heeled boots. He could be wearing these riding boots, but he chooses not to. Um, he chooses to dress in normal work clothes like all the other ranch hands. Slim perceives that he is a powerful person on the ranch, but he's not interested in flaunting it. In spite of the fact that he runs a work team, the first words he says to George and Lenny are not, you know, they're not orders, they're not instructions. He welcomes them and then he invites them to be on his team. The narrator also tells us that Slim has kind of a quietness in his manner, meaning he's very observant. He's a good listener. He's not a loud person. He's not shooting his mouth off all of the time. He listens to other people and he watches what they do. George is kind of talking Lenny up to Slim. You know, he's kind of like, this is one of the bosses on the ranch. We need to impress this guy. And so he tells him, well, you know, Lenny, he, he's the strongest dude you will ever meet. He's the fastest worker you will ever meet. And He's just amazing and you need him on your team. Slim isn't as impressed with Lenny as he is with George. He sees like, this is a guy who is not a bully. This is a guy who wants to take care of people. So that gives us uh, good vibes about Slim. Next dude we meet is Carlson. The narrator calls him a powerful, big stomached man. Carlson does a lot of outdoor work. So, you know, powerful makes sense. He's muscled up, but big stomached, if he's doing manual labor all day long, he probably shouldn't be carrying around very much extra weight. 
um, which makes me think that there's either excessive eating or drinking going on here, which means he's got a lack of self-control. Carlson is a very self-indulgent guy. A creepy thing about Carlson is he's got this fascination with violence. You know, he walks into the bunkhouse, meets George and Lenny, but instead of you know, having a conversation with them, you know, where did you come from? What have you been up to? He starts talking to Slim about this new litter of puppies that Slim's dog has. Seems very innocent, but what he really wants to get to is he wants to talk about killing Candy's sheepdog. So he starts the conversation about these puppies like, hey, why don't you give Candy a puppy and then we can shoot the sheepdog. It's a weird thing to start talking about. He has this excessive hatred of this dog. Let's also talk about the sheepdog himself. He's kind of a character as well. You know, Candy tells us that once upon a time, he was a great sheepdog. This dog is smart. He was a worker, I've had him since he was a puppy, but now he's very, very old. Um, he can only drink milk like a puppy. Um, he can't handle solid food. He's mostly blind. He's mostly deaf and he smells like He's got kind of ratty old fur, it's matted, and he doesn't smell very good. Interesting thing about the dog, the only time he like makes a big movement, you know, unless he's following Candy around, is when Curly comes into the room. Like Curly sticks his head in and the dog sits up. This is that sixth sense about animals again. Like this dog kind of senses Curly is dangerous, like this is not a good guy, and so the dog reacts to him. The dog is a parallel with Lenny. The sheepdog is linked to Lenny. They are both said to have pale eyes. When we first meet Lenny, the narrator says he's dragging his feet. When we first see the dog, he's described as drag-footed. Like Lenny, the dog is a magnet for violence from a person who tends to be a bully. So Lenny is a magnet for violence with Curly. Like Curly immediately fixates on Lenny as someone that he wants to have a go at. Carlson immediately fixates on the dog as something, you know, I can get my gun out, I can kill this dog. He wants to be violent and the dog is an acceptable target. Now in chapter one, I talked about um, this escalation of violent incidents that we're gonna see throughout the book. So in chapter one, we had um, this story about how Lenny has accidentally killed some mice and how he touched this young woman's clothes um, in their, at their old job in weed and you know he frightened her. So these, this unintentional harm that happened in chapter one. So in chapter two, we get an escalation. There's a threat of intentional violence from Curly and from Carlson. This is the next step up. This is the next domino falling in this chain reaction of violence, which is gonna continue in section three. All right, that's all I've got on section two. Um, if you had some other questions or there's a different book that you're interested in, definitely drop those in the comments. I'll do my best to help and good luck to you. I'll see you in the next chapter.